Good evening. For those of you who are here for the first time, we especially welcome you and we're pleased to have you join us at the first Design Forum for 74. We have a very special person with us tonight and um, I'm very proud to have been asked to introduce her. Sheila de Bretville is a designer, a commentator on design, a partner in an architectural firm, uh, an outstanding kind of person involved in the field of design and education. She was educated at Barnard College of Columbia University and at the Yale University School of Art and Architecture. She is a co-founder as well as president of the Feminist Studio Workshop as well as the New Women's Building downtown, which I'm sure all of you have been hearing about or will hear about in due time. She has spoken at many colleges and universities across the country and is currently on staff at CalArts, California School of Design at Valencia. It gives me great pleasure to present to you Sheila de Bretville. How about to your neck? Is that too good or too close? Mm -hmm. Tell me to get an overdose of Brooklyn accent with this thing too close. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. Is that there's something, there's something uh, perilous about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. that's all right. Let's try it. I'll just stand still. Yeah. <laughs> that's I have some I have some quotes later on that that I don't know by heart. So can I get can I have them? I'll need that eventually if I don't know any of those by heart. Okay. Do you want to No, I can stand. It's actually two hours worth of stuff. I hope you're. Um, when Shelley first asked me to come, I really was all ready to say no, not because. I don't want to know all of you because I've just gotten really tired of talking to people about anything. And you can't hear. Um, I haven't always been talking about my work in the context in which it was being done. I generally just did it. And then I realized that I really cared about people knowing the intent behind what I was doing and that if I wanted that to be known on a wider scale, since my work has generally gone to a small audience, I'd have to make more noise about it. And so for the last year and almost a half, I've been giving lectures around the country. And I've gotten very tired of doing so. But the reason I'm here tonight is that so many of you came up to the uh, AIA convention in Man Monterey and were so responsive to my work and came to Immaculate Heart when I spoke earlier this semester that it would be totally ungrateful of me not to be here tonight. Uh, in gratitude to your kind of energetic response. So here I am. And um, what essentially I'll be doing is showing you the way I've begun to look at design again from a pe feminist point of view at the time which I became involved with the women's movement, which was about two and a half years ago. Um, despite the fact I went to a Barnard, w which had a feminist and spectacular president who retired the year that I graduated in 62, I really never got involved with women's movement stuff thinking I'm, I'm doing quite fine. It wasn't until I came out here and began to think again and then began to think about design again that I began to put anything together at all. So why don't we start with the first two slides. Um, um, or bit. I took part in the writing of this copy which now is somewhat embarrassing to me because I would now say if we are to make a deliberate contribution to society we must. Um, I don't like getting into the he dash she bit, so I'd have to rearrange the, the text. But the reason I'm showing to you it as well is how the thing is designed. Am I blocking some people's vision by standing here? Is mm -hmm. he It's weird. Um, it's because this work, like all of my work and everything I say, is biased. I'm speaking to you from my point of view. In no way is the truth in with a capital T. And I know that most of the time that I was in school, any kind of lecture about work um, not particularly work that someone was doing, but work of discussing someone else's work was handed to me like it was the truth. This is the, what you were seeing, this is what the artist was trying to say, this is what the work was about. In this case, I'd like you to be very aware, as I am aware, that I am, I am biased. 
that I have certain things I care about, certain intentions that I care very much about, and they inform my work. And by being as explicit as I can to you about what I'm doing and why, I hope that um, you will be able to understand it better, and also that um, it will make sense in, in a larger context as well. So I'm going to be explicit about as many biases as I can locate. Uh, one of the other reasons for doing it is that I think that all formal language um, carries values, and that if I can be explicit about the values that I think are carried by my formal language and try to read those that I see in things around me, then you can begin to do the same and also qualify what I say as well. In this case, not only are my values about what I think is important in design evident in the copy, which was written rather collectively, it's also part of the way the thing was made. When I first came to Kellogg's, what was exciting to me was the thought that maybe I wouldn't have to keep designing the print on paper, which is what my experience has been. Perhaps if we went back and checked our assumptions about what the message was about, it would be possible to come up with other kinds of forms. For instance, if you have to say something, why does it have to be a poster? Maybe it, has to, it should be um, color lights or fog or a radio program. You know, what is it we're trying to say to whom? How many of them are they? Where are they? What would reach them best? In this case, um, uh, the uh, thing I'd like to point out is the way the thing was made, which is skin wrapping, which is what is used for a lot of the products that you find in the supermarket. That's one of my biases. I love mass-produced technology in, in so much as some of the methods um, that it uses and some of the forms that result are very exciting to me, and they, they seem to offer a lot of options. I don't see technology as really either benevolent um, or malevolent, but rather something to be used, and to be used uh, intelligently and humanely. And so the fact that there were 15,000 of these numbers to be done allowed me to use the processes of skin wrapping the way they're used in the supermarket to do something that's two-color and three-dimensional for 10 cents a piece, which is quite cheap. I love when I can do something that looks like more than it is in terms of what it costs. That's one of my other biases, and it comes from a kind of weird morality that started probably in a Bauhaus, if not before. Um, so that gives you some of the things a little bit about me. The next set of slides uh, were taken, and they're a section of a batch that I did about two years ago when I was trying to look at all the aspects of design. So I broke down design into communications. That was the area I knew most about. Objects, buildings, and environments. I figured I'd try to take this new perspective and apply it to all of them. The first one was um, communications. And I didn't do a, a, a full, in-depth, uh, elaborate study of all mass communications. I looked at advertising, and I looked at it from a particular point of view. I took a series of publications of McCall's magazine, which I know goes to the home, and generally to women in the home. I took a series of magazines called Fortune that goes to, uh, to the professional world and to mostly men and some women who are there, and try to see the differences. When I began to see some differences, there were a certain set of differences that interested me. And the picture on the right, which comes from McCall's magazine, which says, what's wrong with this bunch? It's interesting to me because there's nothing wrong with this lunch. That's what it says, nothing, absolutely nothing. There's an amazing number of advertisements in magazines for women that played on making mistakes. Oh, you bought a Bendix, but for the wrong reason. Someday you're going to spill the bleach, and then, you, then uh, one, today you spilled the bleach. All that kind of thing about making mistakes, which didn't, I looked at them the first time around, didn't react at all. Sure, I make mistakes at home. But when I looked at all the Fortune magazines, nobody ever made a mistake. And it was a very curious phenomenon. Next two slides. If I had a... Oh, there's no way for me to... Do I? <laughs> My magic wand. Um, well, th this is... Th so this is one part that interests me, and that was the difference between the way men and women were presented in these two realms, the public realm, a professional realm, and the home realm. Turns out, turns out, and, and, and what, what this was all about, or trying to understand it, seems that men in the professional realm were consistently presented as assured, confident, able to take care of it, in control, knew what was going on. Then more often than not, women were shown bungling and feeling okay about it and learning from it. Now they were allowed to bungle and allowed to learn from that kind of mistake. 
Um, next two slides. These are going to go fast. I have like thousands of slides in there. Not quite. For a lot. So, oh, you're going to give me the machine. Will this uh, put both? <laughs> what will this do? Well, one of them. Which one? <laughs> We're forward. Okay. Um, so rigid was this iconography, and these two ads come from Fortune, that when a, 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 a company needed to present itself as accommodating, it, it used a female figure. Now, it's not that no ad for a male for a company didn't use, that was accommodating or in service capacity didn't use, a, 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 use only female figures, but rather that, it was, that the, the iconography for the both both ways of, of being became very, very um, static. And that um, you saw women in the home helping, helping generally children and men, very seldom helping another woman, but sometimes they even gave sugar to another woman. Um, you saw men always being very decisive, um, very controlled, and began to look, and of course I know, I know as you do that um, mass advertising is very banal and stereotyped, but it began to find that these, this particular kind of rigid separation was carried on in other fields as well. And again, we look at separation as a, a way of controlling people, that establishing boundaries and a kind of simplification has, has aspects of control, and I'll elaborate that. Whoops, I'm going in one direction. I'm um, sorry that this has slipped, but I, and I try to see whether some of these kind of rigid boundaries were involved, were, um, existing in our environment as well. And so I did the same thing. I just, like, like I just picked McCall's and Fortune. I just picked downtown LA and Valencia because I teach up at CalArts. During a time at, at our studio in, in uh, Lafayette Park, I just went downtown. Actually, Peter, this, this I think Peter took. I asked him to go downtown to shoot. And I took some too, but I think this was Peter's. Um, mostly men. If I run into the bedroom community during lunch hour at CalArts, mostly women and children. It was that separated. And, um, I mean, I, that, this is something you've heard before, uh, the idea of city planning separating residential from commercial from industrial. That's nothing new to you. But I think if you look at that kind of separation from this other point of view, what could that separation also be about in terms of male-female male roles and their bounded, the boundaries between those relationships? Then I wondered about the forms themselves that are used in, the, in these two environments and began to look at the curtain wall, which originally um, was designed as a response to freeing uh, circulation from structure, free, freeing up uh, the use of space, uh, a kind of enjoyment of the sensual qualities of, of a glass enclosure. And now it seemed to me that it becomes a, a symbol for corporate secrecy, that kind of evasive um, clothes, throwing, especially when it becomes a mirror, throwing you back on, on yourself, not answering to you, not not being able to perceive what's inside. On the other aspect of it, which seems rather dubious, is a kind of controlled uh, rationality. Just as the ads in, for in Fortune seem to reiterate, perhaps, and to me, definitely uh, too strongly, that um, of, of showing men only being controlled uh, and supposedly always rational and always confident, which everyone who has ever had any intimate relationship with any other human being knows that that's seldom a human being who feels that all the time. Same kind of thing seems to be going on in structures like these, which merrily put glass on north, south, east, and west walls, regardless of where the sun rises or falls or how potent it is. And when originally the, 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 this particular kind of, of surface or the clo enclosing of space was developed in a country like Germany, which climate is rather temperate. This becomes particularly crazy in, in Los Angeles or any southern climate where the sun is really strong or any place where it gets cold. Um, the, the slide on the right is one that will appear again, and I, I bring it in because it too seems like a, a very assured, controlled, um, devoid of, of natural forms. This happens to be, um, both of these are by SOM. One is the, uh, the Pepsi building in New York, and the one on the right is the, um, the uh, Air Force Academy in Texas. I saw somebody asking somebody who, what it was. If you'd like to know what anything is, just yell out. And I, I believe I know what they are. The kind of, of over, overload bounded thing that I'm relating to becomes even more apparent here in Los Angeles with more freedom is somehow allowed or I see more freedom being expressed. This is a build, these buildings are 
about 10 blocks from each other. The one on, on the left, I don't actually know what it's used for, and I don't know who did it either, but it is glass, curtain wall on, on all four sides, and that top sort of two stories is mechanical, which has to counteract this glaring sun, which is banging through, roasting everybody on the in inside. Um, there are other qualities this, which I find problematic too, the fact that if you look out through tinted glass all the time, the world looks rather, rather strange. The fact that the secretaries are seldom at the windows but are in an interior court where they have no way of looking out. There are many things that are hierarchical and authoritarian about the internal landscaping, but it needn't, needn't be that way. The forms don't demand that. That's the way they've been landscaped. But the outside forms have that kind of contr controlled, faked, irrational faked rationality, which I'm beginning to question. And then I looked at the homes, and I take, took great joy, as um, certainly do most English men and women who come to Los Angeles, about the kind of fantasy that runs rampant, particularly in domestic architecture in, um, in, Lo in Los Angeles, that somebody could want a handsome Greta home and actually have it. But it seems that to me that the home has now been the only place where it is still okay to have a kind of human relationship, where warmth is all right, emotionality is all right, failing maybe even all right. Um, and the fantasy becomes all right. And this kind of paralleling should be obvious by now. And what I've begun to think is that, okay, if this is true, that there are values, ways of being, that have been relegated to the home and therefore identified with only women as a woman's way of being, then maybe the thing to do is to try to revalidate those, those ways of being, free them up so they're available to both men and women on a wholesale level. And how could you find forms that would do that? So they must be the kinds of forms that most readily can transmit ideas of, at least the opportunity for choice, the opportunity to really think, the opportunity to be emotional if that's what you're feeling, to be irrational if, if that part of you that is that way without having to mask it. And that's part of the next part of the investigation. Slides like this are ho really to be had by the thousands. I mean, there are many kind of sexist slides of, of women as, as sex objects. I'm not going to get into that. That's been around for so long that you all could read it. And it's really important, but I, as a designer, have other things I want to talk to you about. What I'm particularly interested in is trivializing, um, trivializing ourselves as people and trivializing in the way that we design. And, some, and sometimes this overlaps with my biases, and I'm trying to separate those things out. First, I think that the kind of sleek, sleekness that our cars, and cars have been hit for lots of things, um, that our cars have are just one way of appearing at that. If you, if you make an object like a car look like it's been formed by the same forces that form an airplane, what are you saying about that car? What kind of values are, you, are, you, are inherent in that form? And I think the symbolic nature of the forms we make, whether they be communications, objects, buildings, or environments, are very powerful things. I think the corporate identity of the curtain wall robs it of some of the good things that the curtain wall can actually be. And I think some of the, the, the falseness that, are, that, mold, that mold our cars uh, disallow people to have any kind of honest relationship with it, let alone, and, and even damage the fantasy, though I must admit on Van Nuys Boulevard, fantasy exists quite happily. And I show you this picture of the Vega because, as you see, underneath in the, the, the door of the um, trunk uh, is all the girding and, and corseting that you s associate with um, 19th century women to, ha to keep that sleek exterior that has been demanded of the car. I myself prefer <coughs> this particular Citroën, which I don't own, I think is lovely, but also show you the car sutra that Mario Bellini designed, although it is not in production, because there are things about it that I like. I like the honest... Um, use, as in the Citroën and, and the other one to some extent, of a corrugated um, metal, of metal to give it its stiffening rather than the sleekness. I like the fact that he tried to find ways of freeing up the interior, even if it, I don't know whether that thing actually really works, the car sutra, whether you can have people bouncing all around the inside while it drives, given the, the demand for seat belts, that seems questionable to me. But just the fact that he tried it, he tried to put within the, the size of a sedan the uh, ability to move around, that he, that he made a, uh, a car at least somewhat responsive to its mechanical necessity. And, that it has, and I think that he, he understood there was fantasy involved in this and that there was at least checking of assumptions involved in this is evident to me in the pantomime white face that he has on his characters that are in it. Rather than if you look in any issue of Domus or I can't think of another one right now, where you always have some sort of bare-breasted 
the carefully nippled, um, hidden woman slouching over the latest poltrona to come out of the magazine. That's not exactly what he's doing. Uh, the other thing that I began to look at um, was women in the past, uh, women who I didn't know about, partially out of ignorance, partially because I didn't know to look, and partially because they haven't been given a very much play. And I looked through Mechanization Takes Command, because the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution seemed like a good place to begin, and discovered, and that she may not be new for a lot of you, Catherine Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe's sister, who was a phenomenal lady. Um, there's an, an issue of, um, the last issue of Architecture Plus has an article on the Cambridge School, which was a school for women in architecture before it became the Harvard School. But um, I haven't read the whole thing, I just scanned it. Uh, there's no more publications are coming out now um, showing you the heritage that you, that, women in the, that you have from the women who have been operative in design in the past. But she was very interesting to me. And one of the things that interested me a great deal is that she located the relationship between the position of women in society and, and some formal things, like the kitchen, the position of the kitchen. Seems that the kitchen as a place or where food is prepared was until a kind of burger consciousness grew up in the 17th century, also the place where festivities took, took place. That it was, you, you did the work, which was making the food, and you did the playing around and the eating of the food, all in the same place. That all those things were possible, kind of multiple use idea of space. And that um, as it became a, a separate thing that was really the lower classes that were doing the cooking for you, and they should be kept away from you, and it was more proper that you be seen apart from that, the kitchen being more and more separated into its own little spot. All this is in, is in um, Gideon's book, so you didn't hear it from me. But uh, what I'd like to point out is this idea of efficiency and the fact that most women involved with the feminist movement, uh, at least during the turn of the century, were very interested in efficiency. They were interested in not only where the kitchen was, but also making it very intelligently used because I knew it was using up an incredible amount of women's time. And if she didn't depend so much on domestic help, which was brutalizing other women, and use up so much of her time keeping that kitchen in tow, then perhaps she'd be freed up for other things. And that wasn't a, a foolish connection. In fact, if I can dig out the, tr the slides, it's really rather interesting to me to come upon in an article called Hitting Home in, in Forum, um, a quote from Rebecca Rayner in 1914. This was done in 18, I think 1895. This is, a this is not by Catherine Beecher, the one on the right. That's just a 1923 uh, best breakfast nook, but it partakes of that same attitude toward making a, a very tight, usable space at the in the kitchen area. Now, Rebecca uh, Rayner was the secretary of the Feminist Alliance, and she asked for nurseries on the roofs of all new apartment buildings, for kitchens built for usefulness rather than maids, and for rounded corners without moldings, because they were easier to clean, didn't collect the dust. And that idea of efficiency seems to um, repeat itself a great many times. Another woman who I came upon in 1968 when Domus published an article about her is Eileen Gray, and she's gotten a little bit more notice in the past couple of years. Perspector 14 has um, an article on her, and I think some, she's mentioned uh, in that, this new article in Architecture Plus, and I imagine there'll be some more. I, I myself would love to do some work, a comparative study of her and, and Sonia Delaunay for a variety of reasons that aren't to, to go into now. But she's incredible. And she did her work, and in, in most of her major work that I will show you now, in 1929 and 1930, 31 to about 35. And um, this is like 35, and the, the other two slides would be 29. Um, she's exquisite, I mean, an exquisite designer who nobody paid any attention to until recently. Um, what she did, which is very interesting to me in particular, is her attention to all the little, tiny, intimate details of the inside of the house. Uh, she designed all the, besides doing the architecture, designing the buildings, she also designed every stick of furniture and every carpet. She was a rich lady. She was able to do that. This was for herself, and she did two other buildings. One was for uh, Badovici, who was an editor. And the other one, I don't know, but Graham Sutherland lives in it now. Anyhow, you can look at the, at the things that she tended to do, with, which are like have tables which have a choice of positioning. Um, Have a, t have a table like this. See that, that chain with the key? If you pull that out, then you can lift up 
that part of the table to a several heights that it can be at. That kind of choice making and uh, obviousness of what the materials are really hasn't been played upon until late 60s when Joe Colombo did his very nice spider lamp, which you probably are very familiar with, the fact that it can move off the wall in that arc lamp. It's very clear there's a light bulb there. It's very clear that it's connected to electricity by a wire. All its functions are very clear to you, and there's a kind of flexibility and int intention and interest in choice. This is her apartment, which I must say is difficult to see. If you would like to see more plan a better um, plan of this, Perspective 14 has a redrawing of this. I'm sorry, on the slide. What it is is a golden section of space in which uh, she divides the, 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 you know, the, the major part of it for living space. The other part is a bath and entrance and kitchen. And she uses um, this set of two curtains to divide the entrance from the bath. And um, as you could probably imagine right now, curtains allow you to either be open or closed, to allow you to have a certain multiple use of, of the space, a, a change in, in its attitude toward, um, toward how open you want to be, how closed you want to be. One of them is that perforated metal screen, the other one is fabric, sort of a m metallic fabric. And this particular attitude really didn't reappear again until someone like John Colombo did this apartment, which is, um, also has this kind of choice thing, and also has curtains that can travel on tracks. That kind of multiple use of space, that kind of um, diversity of activity is something that I think encourages choice, encourages people to participate in the environment, at least to some extent. I don't mean wholesale open space. In fact, um, in, this, in, in an interview with Bardo Vici, uh, uh, Eileen Gray argues against this thing she calls the steel camping. She didn't like the open plan. She thought it was too much like camping out. But she used it in this, in this particular kind of way of trying to find some, some, she has only three buildings that you can see. Um, I'm not showing you all of them here. And I'd, I'd like, I'm not giving you, I can't give you everything about each person. What I'm trying to do is tantalize you. And this could have been thought of as the first of many lectures, each of which you went back and really looked in, in, intensely at what was really going on. So I'll leave you to find out more about Island Gray. And now what, what I'm curious about is if it's true that a kind of flexible use of space might, might encourage people to have choice, then certainly systematization is a healthy thing because it allows you to have many different parts that people could reassemble according to their needs. And this is an interesting situation for me to look at the work of John Antonio Mari, who was a student who was chosen um, for my, I think it was a contest, um, for a project to be included in the Italy, the New Domestic Landscape show. And he gave you all these parts, which really looked like a, a structural system which would offer you a great deal of choice. So when he chose to put it together, what he chooses is the most minimal kind of capsule thing where you really can't have many uses at the same time. You have to put back that table if, um, if you want to have any more space in that room. If you want to eat, you have to stop doing what you do on that table. There seems to be a kind of um, confusion about what standardization of parts really has to offer. Um, I'm just leaving out a whole pile of stuff. It's just easier, I think, right now. But um, actually, one of th there were two things. There were two things that I thought were very interesting that uh, Adele Chatfield Taylor included in that article in Hitting Home, and two were quotes from from Housewives. I thought I would bring them up now because they show some of the problems in what I'm suggesting to you. Um, one was uh, from a woman who had an architect design her house, and she said the architect made me believe that the new architectural openness meant independence. And the, and the plan that she had um, accepted and was built was one in which the kitchen was in the middle of the living room, so she could see around everything and everyone could see her. So you were no longer segregated, which is what I was opposing as being one of those possible segregational modes, which allowed you to be isolated, where work, the work in the house is separated from the leisure or the uh, integrated activities in the house. She said, but having to do it, all the cooking, cleaning, supervising, screaming, and the plain view of my family was the only thing that is new. And I think. I bring that up to you to show that, that, that unless attitudes change, there, is, there are limitations to what you can do with forms. The forms do imply attitudes, but we've had lots of flexible spaces in, in which the panels never get moved. But it takes more than that to make change. The other thing which is interesting to me um, is a comment by, by a housewife that was in that magazine which said that her home demands attention 
because it's made up of things like single-purpose machines that have to be used to justify their purchase, and extravagant, useless spaces that need to be polished and admired. For a long time, this meant having me admired. I used to go along with it because having things meant being someone, but I am not a house. Now, I throw, I throw that in here right now, too, because um, I think it's an interesting thing to think about what actually the efficiency idea has to offer. And here's an attempt in a slightly other direction, one in which is that this would be a kind of con conceptual kit. This is a work in progress, um, which you're seeing is just a working model. But what it's about is providing parts and providing a grid um, that would allow for the person working with this to try out different assemblages of spaces to begin to challenge, in fact, what, what you wanted in, the, in terms of a house, in terms of whether you wanted a kitchen that was open or closed, did you, did you really want an upstairs, what might it look like, to begin to play around, to, to, to separate the difference between conceptual and actual frameworks for, for your invest, investigation of ideas and attitudes. Whoops. No, let's get it back on that side. Okay. So what I've, I think I've done is begin to offer you um, ideas about ways in which you might begin to have a more participating public, more interaction with people who you're designing for and for yourself. What forms would that mean? There obviously would be forms that would allow for certain amount of choice, certain kind of openness. One, another way besides, say, an open plan or flexibility in the plan, um, or uh, interchangeable parts is the idea of a kind of linear planning, one which gives you freedom or flexibility or choice perpendicular to the line and along the line. And I just give you one small example of it, which is a house designed by a young woman architect named Susanna Torre in New York, um, which is a model for a house being built in Puerto Rico, in which she tries out a linear plan. And she has a rather elaborate argument for a thing called appropriation of space, in which she gives you some of the rooms of our finished off and some are just left there for you to appropriate in time when you, when you really are ready to, to use it for something or you know what it is. And what's interesting to me about what she's saying is that if you give people just enough, enough to, that they couldn't do with that themselves because you are a professional and do no more, then you validate what professional isn't about and then you give them enough space to act out their needs, their dreams, their meanings. And I give you um, Chadrack Works was his Berlin Free University on the right, partially because I think he's not been given the kind of um, stress and uh, applause that his work deserves. And by so doing, um, give himself both a kind of uh, backbone, you know, a kind of strengthening system, as well as um, freedom to be responsive to particular needs. Uh, this next set of slides have to do with the future. What does all this mean? If we continue along as we are, keeping public and private separate, defining um, ways of being to each of those realms, what happens in the future? And I was looking for um, sci-fi books or um, future diagrams, future studies by women, and I couldn't find them. All I could find were novels that many of them really find that you yourselves have read like H.G. Wells. And um, it was interesting to me uh, what, what some aspects about the, the, male, the men who wrote critiques of our society, uh, what, what were the kind of societies that they pictured for us, especially when they were critiques. And they were, have worked very well. They generally use satire, something which allows you to measure the present against this possible future in order to find the present lacking so that you will change. I mean, that's the, the mechanism in those kind of things. The only thing I could show you that, you that I could find were these studies by Super Studio done as 12 cautionary tales for Christmas. And they were curious to me because they seem to have many of those characteristics that I found in the fortune ads and in the, the corporate world and in the structures. They seem to stress um, ways of being and environments that were essentially uh, where all emotional or subjective interference is edited out because that's too hard to administer in a society where anybody has any kind of alternative ideas of anything. Essentially authoritarian, essentially hierarchical, seldom had any kind of 
um, natural element in them. And I'll show you, uh, many of you may be familiar with, with these, give you a chance to read them. This is a particularly hierarchical one. And I'll show you again the um, Air Force Academy. Not only because of the grid, <laughs> Uh, and that's kind of formal analogy, but because I really think there are things that are, that are values and attitudes inherent in these forms which are reiterated in these particular architects' warnings about a negative, possible negative futures. And what are women, women doing? Well, it seemed to me that there were women very active in a kind of future thing, but what they were active in were communes, communes that existed in real time, in the now. And I try to understand why perhaps women didn't participate in making either satires and critiques of present-day society in order to change, or fantasy things like sci-fi stuff, but rather chose to do something now. And I have two alternative possible things, none of which are really proven. One is that once you are not given any power to really affect society or to think that you are in, in the professional world and are relegated to home, you really are very aware of day-to-day -day problems, the very real, sort of small-scale, little stuff. And those things you can affect, you can do something about. And I think there's a certain connection that way. Um, anyhow, what I have for you here are, on the left is a comparative study of just the living quarters of one, two, three, four, five different uh, communal environments. And the one on the right is the beginning of some work of a young woman by Alice, named Alice Constant Austin, who was a, an architect. And, that plan is shown on the right here. This was drawn by um, Dolores Hayden with a group of young women architecture students at Berkeley, um, among which was Leanne Hurst. And uh, women were very active in all these communes. The Shakers were started by Anne Lee, who believed herself to be the female, um, not antidote, female, female equal to Christ. And um, the setup for the Shakers, which was a celibate community, was equal men and women separated, absolutely separated. But there were two, men, two deacons and two deaconesses in every facet of Shaker life. Um, the Anada community, which is in upstate New York, practiced complex marriage, a form which nobody else was practicing, so they had a little hard time figuring out what would be the living arrangement when you did not have a sustained long-term relationship, sexual relationship with a person of the opposite sex. And so I thought they did something that was very fascinating to me and I think indic indicative of possibilities for leaving things open a bit. They created a space. The outside of the space had uh, the building was ionic columns, so they didn't do anything very innovative there. But the interior of the space had um, separations that went male, female, male, female for bedrooms. It had a second story, a kind of um, mezzanine level that looked over it, and there were people always supposed to be on that mezzanine level looking down into the sitting room, which meant that if they saw two people going off too often together, they could tell it to the next meeting and prevent that kind of activity. Beneath Beneath the second, the sort of peering or watching area were hung uh, canvas curtains between the rooms because they weren't sure if this form would work and they weren't going to build anything that isn't going to work so they just let it hang loose for a while. And when they found that it worked, they finally built the walls between the rooms. And I thought that was a rather interesting thing. Unfortunately, um, pressure for all these groups have had a lot of hard times, some of them no longer exist, from their outside communities because the things that, that c these communes have in common is they saw themselves as unique, they saw themselves as prototypical. They were going to do something that was so perfect that everyone would look at it and see how perfect it was and repeat it. And so they, tr they generally documented what they did very, very carefully so that you'd be able to repeat it. The women's commonwealth was all women. It makes it very easy and um, you can see that how they, they would have options for women together and women alone. The North American phalanx was run somewhat after a kind of Charles Fourier idea of um, communal living, which was particularly interesting to me because Fourier is the only uh, commune leader, although he never actually lived in a commune, but he used to come home every day at one o'clock just in case somebody would come and build his commune. That was a programmatic thing in his life. He edited out no personalities. Almost all co communes and all ideas of the future say this, and our society certainly does, say there are ways to be which are just not okay. Fourier didn't believe that. He thought that you could make connections between people and connections between people and work 
based on the idea of passionate attraction. And the way that he thought passionate attraction would take place is if you had circulation spaces, and he planned designs that had a lot of circulation spaces between one activity and another, one place of being another, which he asked to be covered with luscious bowers. It was, more, it was very beautiful where you had to wander through, that it would create the environment for passionate attraction to take place. That would mean every masochist would find, you know, this is, every sadist would find what they needed, and everyone could be there. And while it wasn't, wasn't ever built, and he had an architect named Considerant through the drawings, and they're terrible, his ideas in, in his, um, I think they're terrible, in, in his, um, his writings really are very, very rich. They're basically socialist in nature, but they have all kinds of fantastic overtones because he was afraid that, that he couldn't get a client to build it if he was too overtly socialist. So he had fantastic things like how to make the water sweet by putting sugar in it, all kinds of things which I really don't think he did seriously. But he did them as a kind of overlay through which he hoped the real people would perceive and the other people would be just a, you know, a kind of filter screen. Yano Del Rio was here, virtually here in Los Angeles. It was started in, ni in 1935 in, um, on the other side of the San Gabriel Mountains when, I'm afraid I don't remember his name, a guy ran for, for mayor and when he lost at the last moment because someone had done some dirty number, um, left and um, started a Marxist commune. And it was designed by a woman architect named Alice Constance Austin. And she has a book which was called The Next Step which talks a lot about efficiency. This efficiency thing seems to come up all the time. And I bring you her work uh, in a sort of superficial detail, hoping that you'll find out more about her. I'm sure there'll be some, someone will do an in-depth study on her in the near future. Because it was near here, it seems crazy that she should be near here and no one know about her. Her idea was that if you designed a house which was divided this way, we see these dotted lines here? This is one house from here to there. Now that house was soundproof. She was big on sa soundproofing. That would mean that you could have yourself look in only on windows of your own windows and you could have your own garden. And uh, she found that very important for some reasons that were very specific. Like she felt if you had houses where the gardens were all in back, that if you did a really good job in planting things and the guy next door had a lot of weeds, his weeds would screw up your garden and that wasn't fair. And if you could have building around your garden, it would be safe. But she had other reasons, too, which had to do with making the quality of life. Could you turn the slide back on the right, just a second? I mean, she really wanted to have a plan for beauty and comfort and peace and great savings. And she was looking for the ways to do that. And what was interesting to me about the introduction to her thing was um, Pynchon said that here lies the technical foundations of the city of the future, wrought out by a woman. Here's a man writing, so it's the city of the future. This is a building, it was being built. Brought out by a woman with the mind of an engineer, the good sense of a practical housewife, the spirit of Jean d'Arc, and the imagination of a poet. And it's, the, it's, the, it's actually the, the, um, the good sense of a practical housewife that really interests me. Because I think if someone ever does some real design exhibition about women's contribution to design and they really check out the housewives, they're going to find out that there's some incredible intelligent design going in the house. Um, I think understandings of ecology, and youth that have not been tapped yet, but that's just a private thingy. The other thing that was interesting to me about her was that she didn't care what, what you can put that ahead for me, okay? She really didn't care what facade it had, although uh, there it looks very California, sort of Irving Gillish on the right. It could be Italian, it could be Pueblo. That wasn't the important thing about the design as far as she was concerned. She had many different plans. She really talked about in her book wanting to create a framework, which she felt this kind of soundproof wall between two to a building which had a courtyard in it could be shrunk or expanded depending on the site, put a different facade on it, that it gave you a kind of structure that allowed you a freedom within it, and then you could have any kind of plan inside that house you want, but she gave you some alternatives. Most of them had to do with, this is a sort of narrower one, where the dining room would be an extension of the court, and she talks about the dining room being glazed over so that you really felt it as an extension of, of the court. Um, here's another of that. We needn't go into that in great detail. The book is called The Next Step. It's in the UCLA Architecture Library. Um, perhaps you can get other copies of it. Whoops, I'm sorry. This is, a, this is on the right. It should have been two, but I think you can tell. It's really the roof. And what she's planning for is your ability to, to, live, to sleep on the roof, to have um, 
a kind of a tent-like thing under the eaves that you could pull out in case it rained. You begin to use, use the roof, use the sun. Um, is it one of one? She has several plans for how you could use that particular basic structure, which she felt could be used many different ways. She had ideas about a hub, uh, one in which for every uh, thousand uh, houses there would be a communal kitchen. She had this like, some of the ideas are a bit fantastic. <laughs> like she thought the houses all should be built four feet off the ground and have four foot basements. What would go on in there would be a kind of circulation system to your basic hub and central kitchen. So you had a kitchen of your own, but if you wanted to have food, you could sort of call to the central kitchen and it would come through this sort of subterranean uh, number. And she had other plans, a radio Ebenezer Howard type plan for a city in which all kinds of, um, of services could be fed into these particular houses. That, to really go into that would take a long time. And I'm really less skilled. This shows you the kind of garage set up and a couple of her elevations. Whoops. Why am I doing that? Oh, I'm going to need that thing again. Um, I show you this graphic. I did a, a project with some young woman graphic designers about the future, trying to get them to imagine possible futures. This is before I realized why that would have be, that would be difficult. Uh, one of the things that, that one of the women came up with was this one, which is very interesting to me. She made this poster of mechanized women. This is a, an image from Metropolis of a kind of mechanical woman, and herself sort of er and uh, gritted that, and then herself going through that sort of having every range of emotions and stopping. And it was really amazing, this group of, of 10 women who took this small project all found it very difficult to imagine a positive future. All were terribly frightened by technology, were very much back to the earth, grow your own vegetables, break your own breadish kind of thing. Found technology a very malevolent kind of thing and had a very hard time even seeing the beauty in Eileen Gray's work because they found anything that was machine-made so horrific. And that was a very interesting thing for me to come upon and showed how much kind of work would have to be done with the industrial revolution and technology in order to understand what we could use it for and how to arrest it from the kind of meanings and uses it presently has. And the other thing that was interesting is uh, Super Studio did another series of, of, of slides of um, actually lithographs, uh, which I can show you now, but you could see very easily in the Italy, the New Domestic Landscape um, catalog and elsewhere. I can't think where the other elsewhere might be, probably um, Casabella. So, and, and this particular one was more positive. This future depended on a benevolent technology, one in which the grid now believes, um, now means a grid of information and services that would be available everywhere, so you could have everything that you needed. Therefore, you wouldn't have any objects which society had impregnated with status-seeking values or any other values. You'd keep objects because they were useful tools or because they were souvenirs, something that meant to you privately because someone had given it to you or because you cared about it. And that you could wander anywhere. It sort of lauded the kind of nomadic life that was sort of made popular by, uh, in, this, in America by ant form in the late 60s. Um, but they don't let women go into this future. And what they say ab about her is this. Um, a lady of our acquaintance became hysterical at hearing the story. The story is how there will be services everywhere and you won't have to take any objects anywhere, you could just go and said, I certainly have no intention of doing without my vacuum cleaner and mowing machine and electric iron and washing machine and refrigerator, and then it goes on and on and on, listing all these objects. And that kind of attitude toward it being woman herself who wants all these gadgets seems to be a particularly sexist um, approach, and then it made me lady a little less surprised that now designing for banks. At any rate, it seems very clear to me that it is necessary for us to look to uh, technology again very carefully and reinvestigate the Industrial Revolution and what, it's, what it really has to offer and not make it into a kind of style or fetish game. Okay, this is, that is really all I'm going to give you a kind of overview, which in some ways I feel is embarrassingly superficial and could be done in a great deal of depth. But it gives you a kind of context of my thinking for, you to show you the, for me then to show you some of my work, because in fact I'm not an architect. I'm a graphic designer. Most of my experience is with type and printing on page. And where I can be most explicit to you is to tell you why I do what I do. And so um, I thought I'd show you the whole earth catalog because it was put out in the 60s. Um, and it carried, I thought, graphically, some of those values that are relegated to women in the home. Um, and, and 
began to break away from some of the established patterns of publication, insomuch as that it invited anyone who would to write in about something that they used um, and therefore validated that kind of individual subjectivity and, made, and, and widened the range of sources, widened the range of participants, encouraged participation. And I think those were very, uh, very important aspects. The other thing that I think this represents to me, although this is graphic, is some information that I got from Juliet Mitchell and Women's Estate, which is the, the actual basis for the women's movement in some of the movements of the 60s, such as um, the, the counterculture, free, say the free speech movement that first really yelled out about one directional channels of communication. The um, whole consciousness and counter movement which made emotionality in public okay. These are the ta ways in which there have been some things, most of them actually starting in California, which began to break down those separations between what you did in public, what you did in private, what was okay for men, what was okay for women. And this is the only graphic representation I really can offer you of that that I found in any way feeding my work. Um, not too long after that, I was involved with an Aspen Design Conference in which I tried to do something similar than that, to that, in so much as the conference itself um, always has, as most conferences do, a publication which comes out about six months after. Uh, and in that publication, uh, the, the stars who gave the speeches are ex excerpted. You get an excerpt of each of the major pre presentations, and then you get what other stars who didn't speak said about them. And that's about all you get. And I thought that makes the populace feel very much like the populace. I was looking for ways that I could make the people who come to the conference be the conference. And so do, in a way, the only way I, I could do that, although there were some other ways that I began to break down, but the only way I could do that graphically was with a publication and have the publication, instead of designing it six months later, do it while the people were there. Which meant that when we did the box, we gave everybody one of these cards which explained what I was doing, and they were more available. And what that says is that the IDCA is designed to permit the conferees to play a more active part than they have in the past conferences, rather than sending out a publication several months after the conference, which includes major speeches, we intend to produce a record of the conference while it is going on. The speeches themselves may be purchased on cassette tape, but reactions to the proceedings will be recorded by the participatory edition of the Aspen Times, to be published in Aspen and available Friday. The pages have been divided into modules, 12 pages of these, mo well, needless for me to describe it, and I, I, this little bottom part had a diagram of a page so that you would understand how your part would be put in. And the night before the conference was over, I took all the pieces that came and glued them down. I would given away out uh, several um, in, uh, Polaroid cameras, and so I had pictures to use. Plus, there's a guy who takes them at every conference and will immediately give you any picture you need. And I glued them all down. And, and what's interesting is that using, like using that design school poster, which is a very cheap, quick method of doing things, doing, using rotary offset um, is very, very quick. It takes about an hour to print up the 5,000 that we did. And it's a little chintzy, it's a little bit rough, as is that poster, but it's very, very cheap, it's very, very fast. And um, this worked out fairly well, in my estimation. Anyway, it's won lots of awards, so other people think so too. Another thing that I did, which part another method of that, um, is the Aspen, I mean, the Aspen Society issue that I designed. And that is part of another way of doing that. One other way to open up the number of resources, to allow people to participate, to invite them to be part of something, is to make for guest editorships and guest designers. That allows it to be a, 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 a larger number of people who have a chance to have affect things rather than these small groups of elite who constantly are editors of the same magazines who employ the same um, writers to write articles about the same people. Now, how can you begin to break some of that kind of thing down? So I was asked to be the editor and designer, not because of any of the things I'd like to be the reason for, because nobody else wanted to do it. Um, they had said that, that, that um, our society ha had asked for CalArts to do it, and uh, everybody was so busy writing up programs and interviewing people and hopping all over the United States that they didn't want to spend the time, so I took it over. It was given to me, actually, but then I took it over. And nobody wanted to write anything new because they were too busy. So I thought, how can I make a picture of the CalArts and the forming? There were no students um, from what's around. So essentially it's one of those information things of collecting bits and pieces and putting together them together in a framework that will allow people to see them and uh, understand them. It also meant that I had to reconceptualize and rethink 
how a magazine is put together. I mean, there's certain limitations. It had to cost a certain amount. It couldn't cost me any more than a dollar a piece and, um, because they sell it for two dollars. And I think it would be interesting if you compare this issue to other issues of our society. This looks far more expensive. It's another one of those times where I wiggle and ride and, and understand a process so that I can make it look more than what it is, or, or at least spend less than one should um, or could. Uh, and what I did was collect a whole range of information and then to, orga whoops, then to organize that information differently. And one of the ways that it's organized differently is that you do not get a content page right in the beginning. At first you go through about um, 16 pages, which is a signature, of each of the kinds of information that I'll be presenting so that you have an idea of there being different things happening. When you want to know who did something, who wrote what, you can look their name up in the alphabetical index, and that's when you find out who's the president, who's a student who's applying. That's my bit for breaking down the hierarchy. In fact, there was a president, there were students, the place was fraught with hierarchy, only I didn't want to see it. The other way of linking material this way is to have sort of thematic things run through, otherwise it looks like pure chaos. And many other magazines which do use this fragmented thing do seem more chaotic than ordinary society. And there is a lot of content in the magazine which talks about the primacy of word over gesture. So there are a lot of different kind of gestural motifs through it. In addition, there were, article, there were letters from Herb Lau, who was the provost, to Mark Harris, who was to be a faculty member, about um, the planning of CalArts. So that gave me a chance for you to see how CalArts was being planned, but also because Herb was very politically oriented, find out what the context of the United States was during the, that decade, because he often talked about what was going on. So you find that there is talk about uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination, that's Ethel. There is talk about Hubie. Um, it is not arbitrarily thrown in there for their graphic quality. There are definite connections and there are waves of, of themes working as light motifs in the publication. Here's some more gestural stuff, stuff by students. Lewis Tanner happens to be my nephew, <clears throat> but he was a student at CalArts, applying to CalArts. Then there were things that were slightly different. I had asked several people to make a record of their um, tra trip from home to CalArts. This is Alan Capro leaving beautiful Pasadena, riding to the downtown, getting to CalArts, which was then on MacArthur Park, and then going home. Um, and as you can see, there's a grid system behind it. There are things in graphics that are in ways many, much like architecture um, if you want to use them. You can, you can argue that a column has to appear at a certain interval in order to carry um, the weight of, of a beam. In my case, there anybody can say, well, you can put type anywhere. I always create a kind of underpinning structure when I design, at which will give me the freedom and hold it together. It's very important to me, and it is no more likely for me to respond positively when a uh, client says to me, how about any little bit of stuff down here, a little small over on the right, any better than you respond about someone saying, the door, I think I like the door a little bit to the left, and maybe in green, not blue, for an arbitrary reason, when I have definite criteria according to which I work. and make, It makes sense to me. On the right is a, um, a thing that was originally a tape that Craig Hodges had done, which had five voices. And by setting things to different measures, but all the same type, I can, and printing it on translucent paper, you get some of that kind of overlay of voices, being able to understand something, not quite understanding it, seeing that, hearing a little bit of something, or rather seeing it, trying to find analogies between the written, uh, spoken, and, and visual phenomena. Then there were things about what was going on at that time, an ad like this, which is straight, or the, the San Bernardino Hill Xerox, um, away with little houses. This is just to give you a flow of the things. I didn't bring it with me. There were also different kinds of um, papers in it, most of them chosen because of content, although I did use it to some extent to add color where I couldn't afford it. And then the star motif. This is Astro Flash, which we sent in the day that Cal Arts was first conceived. We sent to Astro Flash, and they wrote out our future, which turned out to be rather true, surprisingly so. Uh, an article by uh, Richard Farson, who always likes to be on the leading edge, and by cutting a star through the LA Times, um, I found that there was always something about something he was talking about in it. Uh, this is to give you a little taste. This is not my work. This is the work of Sonia Delaunay in 1917. But I thought there were some interesting parallels, or things I'd like to flatter myself with as parallels, that were interesting to me. She tended to use, use this is I used um, a different either um, 
typesetting or measure or flavor for different kinds of content. She chose to have a different typeface and a different color for different kinds of emotional states or content in Blaise Saunders' poem. And this particular book, uh, which you can focus it a little, um, is six feet long and it just un unravels. And I find that, that that kind of flowing and interrelacing of things is something that's very interesting to me. And it was, I just came upon this book about uh, six months ago. And uh, the thing about it, which was so opposite, which I bring in too, is that she spent every penny of Blaise Saunders' fortune on this book <laughs> to make it. And it's something that actually appalled me the first time I found that out. And then I read this lovely poem that Blaise wrote to her about how he loved the book. He didn't care. <laughs> and it seemed that I cared more about him, her spending the fortune than he did. And that, that sort of reminded me how much it was really a bias. Um, I first came to that idea of fragments that make up a whole as part of a way of sort of fighting simpl simplicity. If you remember those ads that we saw, they always had one image, one major headline, and then a little bit of type that gave you some other stuff at the bottom. But basically in the content, in terms of the words, they wanted you to get this idea of, of what was going on fast and accept it and leave. And in terms of the formal language they use, of one image, one major headline will type, in a very sort of simple, straight, catch, potent kind of, of formal language. That's really what most of our advertising and most of the design that's around is about. Art, on the other hand, has always played with more complicated or fragmented or less potent than that kind of initial single thrust way of presenting material. I've gotten very interested in that kind of fragment making a, a whole that is bigger than the part. And I assigned a problem like that to students and I hope that you can see this picture on, the, on, um, on your left because it was done by a student who then wrote a little piece as if she was someone who had not made this looking at this piece. And what she said was, her name is Bia Lowe, is its cryptic presence overshadows that of its ingredients. We recognize these symbols in an understanding of their total symbology or at the very least in a resolution that they may be unified meaningfully. I think what she's implying is that the human mind really can't stand total chaos. It really tries to organize. It not only needs complexity, but it won't accept a totally chaotic situation. If you have a, a simple dot pattern, people will first see stripes this way and stripes that way. So you just don't see the whole field. And so the same thing when there's content on a grid, you will try to make sense out of it. And this is the sense she thought that someone might see looking at it that way. First you look, you look and you see parts. Masculine hands describe, define, offer, repulse, threaten. The only feminine elements are solely and grotesquely sensual, bodies fulfilling a seemingly obligatory Tory sexual role, hairdos delineating a faceless area, and a non-existent identity. Many of the superficial accoutrements of a culture are present, and yet little of the whole human being is seen. Despite the constant sexual innuendo, despite the, the um, area given to tools of a communicative sort, despite the hands that gesticulate, promise, or threaten, there is no real touching. The accoutrements and parts have less graphic, linguistic, and psychological importance than the whole. So I think what she's trying to do is make something which is interesting enough that you'll sit and fight it out for a while to figure out what the hell's going on. You might give up and say, there's nothing going on that's interested in me, or you might stay with it and make up a meaning of your own. But in any way, you're not likely to dart off with someone else's point of view. This is what part of the exercise is about. Um, the picture on the right is a Navajo rug, and it's part of an idea that I have that fragmented forms might well be a, a way of expressing a kind of fragmented use of time. Um, and, and in that way even be another reason perhaps electing to use them. The fact that I think as a woman, especially a woman in a home, especially a woman who does not have a career or is involved with a career thrust, the time is particularly fragmented. It's very hard, particularly if you have a child, to do anything for a long amount of time. You, get to, you do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other thing. And I also, though I have no proof for it, think that women, partly, partially if not more likely, but I have no proof of that either, to acculturation, tend to think in, in, in fragmented time. I know that myself, and I don't think in any way it affects negatively what I do, that interspersed between my work and, and egocistic me, me, me thoughts, 
I'm also thinking about if there's enough broccoli in the refrigerator, that my kid didn't look so hot this morning, maybe he's not feeling well, a uh, friend who's really having a hard time, that caring about other people and providing for other people are part of my thought pattern. They're part of my way of life. I've been taught to be a good girl. And um, there's some good parts about that. And if I want to tell people that I think that maybe becoming famous and rich at 40 and working your way to that way or later, um, and being so aware of the future so that you don't see the trivial or even the small parts of day-to-day -day existence isn't such a good thing, then maybe a kind of fragmenting of time, of doing a little bit of work, a little bit of play, uh, and doing work at home, so that home is not only for leisure. Gee, he's a great guy when he's home. He's very short and he really does work. When he's home, he's so loose. If that's separating the kinds of selves that we are or where we are that way, are probably, it's probably good for, for other people. I know it's good for me most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, what would be formal languages? What would be ways of, of making that visible? And I think that kind of fragmented but holistic point of view is something to be played with, and that's why we could do a slick thing, like, you know, like art form. We could really make important the stuff that, that Judy and she were doing up in Fresno. And I said, well, wait a minute. First of all, I'm dying to do a, a newspaper. This was before I had done IBCA. I think Rotary Offset is fantastic. It's the thing that we in the United States do better than anybody else. Good printing can be had in Europe, better than we do. But what we can do cheap and well is Rotary Offset. Let's try to do a Rotary Offset job that looks good for change, instead of all the stuff that is so embarrassing to me that comes from the women's movement. And so in that way, I was, had a more overt and active role as a designer. Usually, you don't question the client quite that much or push your values onto a client. I'm not so sure if that's good or bad. I tend to like to think it's good because I did it. Um, I think if you don't question, then you won't get nurseries on the roof of apartment houses and, um, and uh, commercial buildings because the client sure is not going to think of it. And so it's really important if you have values to push them, uh, fight for them with your client. They're going to be fighting for theirs. And so this is this every woman issue and they bought my idea. So we worked together on it, and what I essentially did was try to find a formal equivalent for the form of small group process. At that time, and still now, there are small, excuse me, oh, it's not a person, it's a, <laughs> it's a wire. Um, <laughs> um, there are women, were women and are women meeting in small groups around the country, and what they do is they practice a kind of thing in which each person speaks in turn. By so doing, someone who is more vibrant or vocal or verbal doesn't dominate the whole conversation. Each person is given a minimum of time in which, at least in which, they, in which to speak. Now, what would be, I've always found that very, very good, because there are times in which I'm a big blabber mount, but there are times in which if there's somebody really coming on very strong, I'm very quiet. I've learned how to do that one, too. And if something isn't provided for me that I know that I'm going to have my turn, um, I may not take it. If you know that you're going to get a chance to speak, you're not worried about will I, should I, can I. It's just going to be there, and you think about how to utilize it. And the way to do that for me in design was to give each woman a two-page spread and a picture of herself. So they were all equal. You couldn't tell by the length of, of the space given to it or the size of the type or the zappiest of, of, of my design. So some, I could make each straight di page different, and then the one that you liked in the way it looks would become better than the others. If made them all equal, then you would have to, by reading the title and some of the content, figure out for yourself which was one that you wanted to read. And so all the spreads look somewhat alike. They all have that same big picture and the type. Again, you can see there's a grid. That's a center spread over there on the right. I did not write the copy. I just uh, laid it out. So you can see they're alike, but they're not exactly the same. And I think they're really quite nice. And I've always been pleased with this. And again, I mean, just to play money games, I don't know those of you who do designing, we had 3,000 of these for $624, two color, 16 pages. This I did not design. It was designed by women in my program. I alphabetized my name in with the others, and I've since felt rather guilty, because that's rather fake kind of non-hierarchy. There was a hierarchy. I was being paid, they were paying. Um, I was a teacher, they were the students. I learned from them, but I was a teacher. And there was a lot of problems with trying to figure out that role of authority or, as versus authoritarian. When was I an authority? When was I being authoritarian? When were they being authoritarian? Got very complicated very quickly. 
However, what I did was rig up a year-long program which had exercises to teach these women, none of whom had ever been designers before, something about graphic design, and also have them learn about feminism at the same time, um, and learn myself about feminism. This broadsheet they designed, set, pr and printed. And what it has, you can't really see terribly well, is the group of us around the Opti camera, which did a lot of this work, a group when we sat and talked, because we had, um, it was a two-day program, one half one half day we just sat and talked about what was going on and I gave assignments in the beginning and one of the assignments was a very dumb trivial one uh, the, the 15 women who opted to take this course um, only some of them were really in the school of design I ended up getting someone who has a degree in psychology and a young woman who was a historian and Ann Williams who had run the press for Hans Georg Meyer and a rather wide range of people and I assigned them to do this dot problem which um, I did partially because it seems trivial. They were very uptight about being in this class. I had a fight to have this, this you know, how to justify being the only woman on the faculty, which I still am, um, doing at least a whole year in which I did not work with male students. Um, they gave me arguments of how, how could I deprive the men of a woman faculty member and all kinds of arguments like that. Anyway, the women themselves took a chance of segregating themselves and didn't, some of them understood very well why we were doing that. Others were not sure. So I chose this, which meant that they just sat at desks in, in the studio and each were given um, a 10 by 10 card and a whole bunch of red dots. And I told them, just put the dots down. And it seemed so stupid that everybody did it without any worry about whether they would go to bed, they talked to each other. And in that way, began to establish a kind of studio relationship where you were, they weren't afraid to see what anybody else was doing because nobody knew what they were doing. And it seemed very simple and dumb. Um, and then I said, all right, let's take them into the dark room and make 16 of them. And in that way, they learned about the camera and what it makes. And then we came back, we put them, I said, put them together in some way. And that's what I learned about modularity about what kind of things you can make if you make a lot of one thing. And if, then if you begin to make the one thing intelligently, you can then control what it makes when it gets put together. And so the subsequent designs, although that has pattern making too, somebody who wanted to have something happen at the corner now knew how to make something happen at the corner. And then intention ad was added to design, being in control, knowing what you're doing. It also allows you to know about graphics, the fact that a halftone process is made out of dots, in that case, the dots are of different sizes. In this case, the dots are all the same size. But it means that the, way, the intervals between the dots, the intervals between light and dark, are how you see three-dimensional objects. And this is a way of learning it other than being told it, which makes it much more real. You want to make a helix? You can make a helix. If you want to make a helix out of words, you now know how to do that as well. And this young woman has gone on to make a rather nice little film with just the word woman a little animated film. Then I gave them an assignment that had to do with words. Um, one woman, Ann Williams, took the dictionary definition of, of a woman, which I thought was rather interesting. And this is what she did with it. The reason I gave this problem is that I was given something similar to this when I was at Yale. It's a way that I was taught, and most graphic designers are taught, about typography. You learned about upper and lower case. You learned about flush left, ragged right. Flush leg left, ragged right, more spacing. Centering. Centering your copy, another option in typography. Setting it many different ways and moving it around, another option in typography. Totally seeming to me arbitrary. How do you decide whether it's going to be flush left, ragged right, centered, more space, less space? What you learn about are the kind of grays it does. And there's a wonderful article, really very well done, that appeared in the, the Journal of Visible Language that explains why this is a wonderful problem. So it really does tell you with words about dark and light, rhythm and typography. However, any relationship of any of those machinations, the content is totally absent. I wanted to give a similar problem so they would learn about typography, but care about what they were manipulating. And so I asked them all to find copy which they had some emotional identification with, which had an effect on them. So if they moved it, they moved it because they cared about where it was going and what it said. And I just brought you one of those so that you can see how someone could, could do a typographical problem like this and have it connected to what they felt. And this is what this woman said. She said, I found that during... The initial stages of the exercise, 
My visceral response to the overwhelming reality of the quote left me at a loss to really manipulate it. I became intrigued. Whoops, wait. I found that. Di well, I can. <laughs> I tried listing the events which I felt would serve to understate the reality. This led me to a diagramming of all the sentences in which all the words could be seen apart from each other, each separately as horrific as the quote itself. Finally, when I could objectively see the structure of the quote, I began to play with its meaning, to construct my own interpretation of it. It seemed that the objects were the real victims of violence, not only from the faceless and nameless rapists, but from the identity list, tralala herself. And then the last sentence, which really makes me feel good. I never worried about whether what I did was stupid or not. It just was. And that's because I think the process was really clear to her, what she was trying to do and why. And she was really connected to the work she was doing, which I really feel that most of the work that I was given to do at Yale, for some reason, I, why I didn't get alienated, I don't know. It was really very alienating. I asked many of the women to try to begin to discover the relationship between words, images, and what images could carry that words could not. And most, much of that didn't go very far. Here's one in which she tried to make an image which she felt embodied what the words were about, but in the, in the language that the image could carry best. There were also individual projects. I found that there were three ways that I, at least, that I have found to work with students. There were more, but there were three basic ways. One is when they all do their own solution to the same problem and thereby can compare the different solutions. That's something I've done a lot in architecture school. Uh, one is to work on a project together where individual contribution is less seen, and I'll show you one of those after this. But I always feel that it's necessary in a year's program, at least for me and my students, to have students do a project that is totally theirs alone. It seems to be right in terms of needs, of ego needs, and it often brings out that particular individual voice. And this is one of those, a woman who is particularly many, many ideas about rape and was very frightened of rape. And she did this book, which she printed herself. And it has, I don't remember how many pages of rape is. And it generally talks about intrusion. Where, not about the actual rape, what you exactly think about rape, but uh, all the ways that a woman can feel rape, intruded upon, like when you're just walking down the street and someone assumes that you are interested and, and invades your, your, your privacy. So then she was very sensitive, too. Um, the project we did together was one on menstruation. Um, I had, during the summer, collected all the films and brochures that are, are given out to young women in um, school when they are about to enter puberty. They're, they're generally separated. The boys go to father and son meetings. The women, mothers and daughters, go to mother and daughter meetings. I assume that that structure itself is destructive, and I'm sure whatever goes on in the father and son meetings is pretty horrible, too. But I only know about my mother and daughter meeting stuff, and um, the actual connection with now you are a woman. Well, what is that all about, now you are a woman? Does that mean when you go through menopause, now you are no longer a woman? Um, what does it mean that now you can have a child when you are 12, 11? You know, what is that all about, and how does a 12-year-old react to that kind of information? How does it form her thought about herself as a person? And it wasn't surprising, finally, when I found these brochures and the film, which is shown in Orange County, is the same film I saw thousands of years ago, um, which has white blood flowing and really makes you seem like you've learned, you begin to menstruate on Monday, you marry on Tuesday, and you have a baby on Wednesday. But those three activities are so connected that they could never be severed from each other. Well, these young women, we, we put uh, together five groups of people, a group of young women who had just gone through menstruation or have begun or have, were just about to. We did it with boys and girls the same age, you know, 12 and 13 also. We did a group with young women about 23 to 24, 5, 6. And then a, one, a group with uh, young men and women, 23 to about 33. And then we did a group of older women, 50 to 75. And these are the younger girls. The group with the mixed group that was young was a disaster, although it has some very interesting parts. They, can hardly talk to each other, let alone talk about the subject together. They keep wandering off. We, didn't do, we did not have a leader in the group. We told them what we wanted them to discuss, and we let them go. And every now and then, we sort of be waving to indicate they'd really gone. I mean, the young boys and girls were out how many holes a bird has and what it does. <laughs> they just gone everywhere. Um, the young girls really were amazing what they discussed. This particular girl on the right um, really talked about how 
she used to just play with guys. They were just her friends, and all of a sudden now she has to walk her dog. She crosses the street. She feels uncomfortable. She doesn't know what it's about. She doesn't know if she ever wants to have a child. What does it mean that she can have a child now? Just having to make choices about whether or not she can have two children in the future right now just blow her mind. Um, very confusing kinds of things came out in this particular tape. However, women, young women that age tend to all talk at the same time, or not talk at all, or get hysterical, and so to listen to it's a very trying tape. The tape with the young men and women was trying because, my God, the men have no experience with which to identify this thing. They volunteered to be in this, and they were trying desperately to understand, but it's a bit foreign, the whole number. I mean, the closest any young man could come to was that when he was around 12, he had found a used Kotex and sort of kept it as a fetish item. <laughs> well, it's not, really, it's not really so funny. It really gave it one of the few attempts of a man to try to understand what it would be like to have this dumb thing between your legs. <laughs> other than the queen in the last exit to Brooklyn. <laughs> However, the take with the older women is really a knockout. Uh, they knew how to make room for each other, to encourage someone who hadn't spoke to speak. It didn't go one in person, another, another. They had to do it in a kind of group pattern. They were incredibly generous with each other. They never knew each other before. It was one, one of the women had organized the group for us. Um, they were spectacular, and it was really beautiful for me to see this tape used and um, shown to groups of men and women and have men who walk in and say, yuck, who are those ugly old hags? Call them beautiful women an hour later. And this tape is now distributed by Vision Quest and is being shown in some schools and to groups around the country. I'm not interested in making art objects. I don't really get excited when they show this at the kitchen or at women's space. I don't like it being looked at as a video concept piece. It is there for educational purposes to allow people to understand the relationship between menstruation, menopause, being a woman, and societal attitudes about growing old as well. But so, I'll show you some more slides because we, were, we had never used, I had never done anything in video. I'm a, I'm a print on paper lady. And it's really interesting to me that if you go back far enough to, you locate a problem, a problem that I'd felt, that I thought was important to deal with, involve people in who had all experienced it, who, for whom it was all something worth thinking about, that deciding what form to take really um, comes last. And so it came out to be video, which we found was very actually easy to use, and we did some damn good camera work as well. And nobody had ever used a video camera. I hope it's not an insult to anybody. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was not difficult. I some of the I've heard the word mystification far too many times in the last few years, but for this time I don't feel bad about using it again. It really was a mystification of that art. It's not so hard to do. Um, Doing that project with women inside an institution really made me think about the possibility of doing it outside an institution. So there's very, all these problems of authority, authoritarian, seems as exaggerated by the Cal Arts structure and all the difficulties of Cal Arts each year seems to lay pressure on what was going on in the group. And so I, with Judy and Arlene, I decided to do a school outside of Cal Arts and to just make it not for a degree, just for women who wanted to for a year, really think about feminism, themselves as women, and, and the work they were doing in art design or, or art history. And the fact that we are from three different disciplines is also significant because when you begin to, swear, to think about the boundaries between men and women, the boundaries between public and private, the boundaries between ways of being and where you can be that way, you also begin to question the boundaries between your different disciplines. Not that you aren't more schooled or more knowledgeable in one aspect, but why label yourself so totally and want to look for the interrelationships, not to become a generalist in particular, but to find some ways of relationship itself. And so we needed to send out a brochure, and I'm sorry I didn't bring one because the thing looks a hell of a lot nicer than it does in the slides. Um, again, I wanted to do a thing that was made out of fragments. It's a brochure, and, but it can be used as a poster, in which it folds open and you get the three of us um, with copy that we each wrote individually about what we intended to do or what we were feeling at the time. The next set of slides and the pictures are pictures that we chose that we felt identified with, work in the past, work that we've done ourselves, um, and quotations. I asked Judy and Arlene to choose a certain number of quotations that they felt aligned with. And one that I chose for myself that I'd like to read to you is one that's something that really bothers me and that I think about a lot and it still is very potent. And it's from Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas, an absolutely exquisite book that she wrote at the later end of her life that makes a very nice pairing with who of one's own, in which she was asked to explain to a, a, um, a learned English lawyer 
how war could be uh, avoided. And um, she has a very long explanation of why she had nothing to do with the war. Um, but she says, behind us, and us she means uh, women, lies the patriarchal system, the private house with its nullity, its immortality, its hypocrisy, its servility. Those are the negative things she sees in it. I tend to stress some of the positive ones, but these are the negative ones she saw in terms of women's role. Before us lies the public world, the professional system, with its possessiveness, its jealousy, its pugnacity, its greed. The question we put to you is how can we enter the profession and yet remain civilized human beings? Well, I think it's hard. And um, I try to do it. But another way that I try to do to preserve the values I have is to, to keep involved and to keep creating alternative context, alternative social relationships, which can become in some way prototypical, but also be feeding to myself. And, and, and creating the Feminist Studio Workshop is one of those ways of creating a social relationship. And I see, see design as being both. Um, ways of affecting the physical world and the social world. I think, I think I'll throw in at this point a quote that I couldn't put in there because it wasn't by a woman. And I really thought that this should, at least in this first brochure, be all women's quotes. And it's from an article ca uh, called The Designer, The Man in the Middle by C. Wright Mills. Reading, reading C. Wright Mills and um, Juliet Mitchell together one summer was one of the healthiest things I ever did. He's a pretty phenomenal guy and this article actually came out in 58 in a magazine called Industrial Design, but then was anthologized in People, Power, and Politics. His whole concept of the cultural workman, something I think is worth looking at again. And what he said, which is interesting to me, was um, he characterized designers in this way. Designers represent the sensibilities of man as a creature related to nature itself and changing it by a humanly considered plan. The designer is a creator and critic of the physical frame of private and public life. I think that was a pretty good description of it. I think part of it, the first part, as being a creature related to nature and changing it by a humanly considered plan, I think it's been distorted in the past, where it was just changing nature, period, without any kind of humanly considered plan. The thing that he said he thought was wrong with American, cul American culture in terms of its effect on design was the following, and that was something that I also think is important is the absence of a stratum of cultural workmen, and he calls designers like artists cultural workmen, um, in close interplay with a participating public that is the single fault of American culture. So long as it does not develop, designers will tend to be commercial stars or commercial hacks, and human development will continue to be trivialized, human sensibilities blunted, and the quality of life distorted and impoverished. In a way, working in the Feminist Studio Workshop and now in the Women's Building is my way of beginning to create and coming, even coming to lecture, I think, too, is my way of creating a public which understands what it is that I'm trying to do and I'm not alone in what I'm trying to do. You can find a relationship between myself and the people with, for whom and with whom I work. Um, this plan for the Feminist Studio Workshop grew during the summer. It grew into the Women's Building, which is... Could you go, could you go back and, and make that slide right side up? I mean, you have to think of it has to be right um, Women's building happened because there was this building, the old Chouinard Art School, started by um, a, a woman named Chouinard a long time ago with very little money and was lying fallow because Cal Arts had pretty much snuffed it out in its creation of its uh, monument to itself in the valley, or on the other side of the valley, in Valencia. And um, we took that building and rented it. Um, from Kellogg, which gave us, who gave us a very fair rent, so I put, shouldn't really put them down um, for leaving it alone. <laughs> but um, we went to this building because we thought it would be better if the different women's groups around the city were in one place. In general, I've always thought that decentralization was the thing, that it would be better to have, not have all the theaters and everything in one part of the city, have them all over the city so people were forced to go to different parts of the city and get to know it, and that it should be a community centered thing. But in terms of the women's movement, there's a lot of wasted energy going on, a lot of not knowing what the other person was doing, not, uh, waste of money. So if we brought everybody together under one roof for a while, then we could decentralize more intelligently later. And so um, Judy Arlene and I went around and got women who were doing work in groups to 
commit to renting from in the building so that we could then present their possible their renting money as our financing for paying the rent as well as the fact that we have 31 students each who pay us $750 for the year so that's our, our, um, our money and we took over the building we named it the women's building because of the um, World Fair in Chicago there was a women's building which had all the arts and crafts for women around the world it was designed by a woman she wasn't well, I don't know how good she was, but the building wasn't anything different than many of the other buildings there. But inside was a very lovely uh, timpana by Mary Cassatt, which is now lost, which Judy likes to say is a symbol of our lost heritage. I can't wax quite so romantic, but I really am sorry we lost the timpana, and I'm really glad we've got the women's building. And I had designed a brochure for the women's building, and again, I had to find a way where I could knock off 16,000 of these things for very little money, uh, make it look like more than the one color that it is, um, give you a sense of it being a place to go and it existing, being made out of, re it's a real place, it's not an idea, the center for the study of blah, 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 which is two people in a little apartment somewhere. It's a real place with bricks and you, and you can go in there and it's a little bit cold right now. There's an opening of all our galleries once a month which attracts an incredible number of people and is a very jolly and, and awa a awake and alive affair. It is open to the public. We want the public to know what women are thinking. It's one of the ways of blurring those boundaries between public and private. Um, it is not all art groups. Uh, we hope to have more and more groups. We're now planning a, a connection between us and a Watt Studio workshop. Um, and it is, I will probably never put all my energies into that place. I'm committed to doing professional work outside of there, to teaching in other places. Um, to be involved in, in all kinds of world, but a very big part of my commitment goes towards women's experiences and, and making it public and making it accessible and making it available and thereby making that which is part of the men's world available to us as well. And I welcome you all to Women's Building. It's open on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we have openings once a month. Look for them in the LA Times. I brought some brochures so that you, some of you at least can have them. And um, thank you for inviting me. amount of space for each one of the groups they could write whatever they want and it took as much space as they wanted it's so that you can do what you want in there the only criteria is that every group that's in there has um, women's experience as what it's talking about well, it can be even men talking about it but that's what it's about and how you do it what kind of sign you want to put in the space that was given you if you want to use the horrible, the horrible colors and typography you ever did go do it you know I say it's okay basically but it looks too hard I mean, certain, a greater amount of freedom than that. And also, there isn't, um, we, there isn't a lot of classes there right now. I mean, the Feminist Studio Workshop is, has not run on a class system. Next, I mean, classes kind of system. Next, next year, we will have a two-year program, which the first year of which will be real classes, much more classes. Right now, it's very much individual crits. You can do that with 30 women, but it's very exhausting. And also, for me, I, well, I should probably tell you that, in some ways, the, the Feminist Studio Workshop and the Women's Building don't fulfill me. Maybe that would be interesting to you, too. Um, and another reason why I was going to come here. Um, I'm very good at working with women artists because I bring them another point of view. However, there are things that women artists can't give to me, which happens to be a design community, the designer's mentality, that commitment to, to the public, that uninvolving, the total egocentric point of view. I mean, I can help women artists talk about their, their female experience better, help them understand materials. Um, I'm just really good critic. But I really want a bunch of designers in there who I can talk to, who will tell me what I don't know about. I have yet to find a whole bunch of women peers in architecture and design who have enough time, because I teach, and if I don't run a professional office, I have more time to really think about possibilities, to let your mind wander, to guess, to do projects which may not be, cost money but don't give you any money back. I mean, I need that kind of group, and I don't have that here. I mean, I, have to, I was in New York. For, for a week at Christmas time giving a lecture at the Architectural League and I got to talk to people who I would do anything if I could get them out to the West Coast because I want to talk to them more and in some ways I don't get that and so it's certainly not a Bauhaus <laughs> yeah it's okay <laughs> just take a stab at it just let it come out Why, why do you think that attitude of, 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 of
fighting, you're, you're doing what you're fighting against. It seems like it's very contradictory. I would understand. A lot of, most of them seem to react that way. Maybe they're up. There are, there are a lot of reasons for it. I'll just deal with some of them. Um, in a way, using the menstruation tapes is one way of dealing with it. When, you know that group that was done with men and women? It didn't work. We didn't get the women to really talk about what the problems were because, and the, men, because the men hadn't experienced it. And this is not because the men don't menstruate. It has to do with a whole range of that experience and its meaning in terms of their role as women in society. It's only when those women were alone with other women, who they talk about that kind of thing in that way because it was shared experience. So there's certain kinds of content which just absolutely cannot be looked at in the same way if there are men there who, for whom that is not their experience. And that is, is a fact. I think you'll probably give me, so that range of content is absolutely necessary. Now the, the tapes themselves, once they're made, are available to everybody. And we want men, even sometimes more importantly than women, to see them. But to, get, to be able to create the object, the object that should communicate the values, we needed to segregate in order to do that. Part of what's inherent in that also is a kind of group consciousness. Group consciousness can be put down for being sexist, but also is a kind of strengthening thing. When you know that you are not unique, and that to some extent, and that other people have some of those same feelings that you're always hiding and not admitting, it gives you a kind of strength to talk about them, to look at them, to look them straight in the face, and to use them and find out what's good about them. To constantly being with people who don't have those experiences or don't value them, then you're afraid to speak about them and you don't come aware of them. Now, I don't think this is forever. I mean, the women's building right now only has groups in it. No, we have a group in it that has men and women in it as well. But we, see, even that's a great departure. I mean, about five years ago, that building would have had to be groups with only women in it. And that building might have been closed to men as well. That would have been necessary. Now that it's not necessary anymore, there are men and women in some of the groups in it and it's open to the public all the time. I mean, there are real changes happening and, and I don't know how far that'll go in my, in my lifetime, but I know that there's like the whole women's movement. When it first came out, when it first became popular, partially because of the media and partially because of myself, I said, I'm not going to identify with that. I, wanna, I don't want to walk around in combat boots. I, know, I, I don't want to scream about being aggressive and me and I can do it and I can fight. That's not my image of myself. I know that I'm strong sometimes, I know that I'm weak sometimes, and it was offensive to me. Now, that was really necessary, it's absolutely necessary to go to that point which is saying, damn it, all these women who have never been accepted by their peers or by anyone else because they were too fat or they weren't shaped right or, or they, they, they um, were too noisy and too aggressive and I can't stand it, she comes on too strong, all those women could finally say, I'm beautiful and I'm alright and it's okay to be this way. Then it became a little longer to be okay to say, you know, I there are things about being like what I'm saying about the home. There are things about being a woman. There are things about the nuclear family, which are fucking good. Let's not just dump out the whole nuclear family. Let's look at it for what's good about it as well. I'm married. I'm a child. At first, I have a child. I'm not apologetic that I married. I just say, what is it? Why would I marry? Why are there things about having a, a relationship in time for a long time with the same person, with a male, working it out to places where it doesn't work, places where it does work in time? What is about that that is constructive for me as a human being and constructive for the society? There was a time where you really, that was the hardest thing to talk about because we were talking about how damn put down they were, how the man assumed that they were going to do all the cooking. When we were first married, I was there cleaning the floors, cooking every meal. It never occurred to me that I shouldn't do those things. And it, was all, and it was not that Peter didn't think that he would do part of it. I never thought to ask and he didn't think to suggest. When, it began, when the things got put up, I said, my God, this is not fair. So little by little, we just changed. It wasn't like we wrote down these rules and we signed that line and went to the Notary Public. It just changed. Both, both oh, this. Play, you know, play, you know, they have their own, their own set of, of, of things that they do, and they're, they're, they're both, both sides are 